Thank you, Mr. Matheson. Mr. Chairman, Congressman Tierney, and honorable members of the subcommittee, on behalf of the 20 million people in the New York metropolitan area who live and work in the shadow of Indian Point, I thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on this crucial public health and safety issue. Mr. Chairman, I'm especially indebted to you for hosting this hearing and providing leadership in the state of Connecticut. I'm also glad to see Congresswoman Kelly, uh, our representative in Westchester, uh, here today who also held a hearing. We appreciate that very much. And also, we appreciate very much the tough questions that you have asked of both the NRC and FEMA. These are questions that need to be asked of these agencies, and we appreciate your leadership in that area. You, like we, recognize that the public does have a right to know uh, what the issues are surrounding these nuclear power plants and the emergency plans. I am Alex Matheson, Executive Director of Riverkeeper, a not-for-profit environmental organization with over 5,000 members. Riverkeeper's mission is to protect the Hudson River and to safeguard the watersheds that make up New York City's and Westchester's drinking water supply. Riverkeeper is not an anti-nuclear organization. However, given Indian Point's inappropriate proximity to New York City and the consequences a major radiological release would have on the area's residents, national security, and the U.S. economy, we regard Indian Point in this post-9-11 world as a unique case that deserves special attention. Located only 30 miles from the world's financial capital, Indian Point is arguably one of the country's most attractive terrorist targets. No facility, if successfully attacked, has the potential to wreak more economic and psychological damage and impose more loss of human life and health than Indian Point. In this heightened risk, envi risk environment, we need at least two things in order to justify the continued operation of Indian Point. Plant security sufficient to repel a sophisticated terrorist attack and an emergency plan that actually works. Unfortunately, at Indian Point, we have neither. In this post-9-11 threat environment, the NRC and FEMA are scrambling. Unfortunately, they're scrambling to protect the status quo and not public safety. It is troubling that agencies are not using language that suggests that they are asking the more basic question here. Are these emergency plans fundamentally adequate? And if not, what do we need to do about that? And should we be considering shutting down Indian Point again, considering it's close proximity to New York City and a dense population. I asked the NRC, if not Indian Point, then what circumstances would compel the NRC to issue a shutdown order? I, too, am alarmed that never in its history has it ordered the shutdown of a nuclear reactor. There has to be instances where it made sense to do so. In January 2002, Entergy commissioned an internal review of security at Units 2 and 3. The review, known as the Logan Report, revealed that only 19 percent of the guards believe they can repel a conventional sabotage event, let alone a 9-11 type attack. Guards admitted they are underqualified and undertrained with respect to gun handling, physical fitness, and training. Guards reported that qualifying exams for carrying weapons are often rigged. Security drills are carefully staged to ensure mock intruders fail. Yet one security guard was able to place mock explosives throughout the spent fuel pool buildings three times all in less than one minute. In addition to weak ground forces, Indian Point is virtually unprotected from either a water-based or aerial attack. There is no regular Coast Guard presence. The only other protection is a structuralist security zone enforced by a buoy tender and an old whaler piloted by two day reservists. The NRC admits that the only way to protect nuclear plants from air attacks is by improving national airport security. However, in response to a 2.206 2.206 petition filed by Riverkeeper, the NRC acknowledged there was a gap between security at Indian Point and at our nation's airports. In December, the NRC took the astonishing step of issuing a decision declaring the risk of terrorism will not be considered in issuing or reviewing plant licenses. The NRC claims, quote, they have no way to calculate the probability portion of the equation except in such general terms as to nearly be meaningless. In other words, because you can't accurately measure the threat of terrorism, it's okay to ignore it in determining whether nuclear plants are safely sited and protected. That may be the most bizarre and dangerous rationale for inaction I have ever heard coming from a federal agency. The NRC earlier testi testified that, that, that they are not responsible and, and, and the plant owners are not responsible for protecting against enemies of the U.S. Well, I would ask the question, if that's the case, who is responsible and which agency of the government, if not Entergy, is responsible for protecting Indian Point? 
The New York Observer did an article last year uh, where they asked all of the, they polled all of the federal agencies, uh, the Defense Department, uh, the FBI, CIA, and others, and Energy, who was responsible ultimately for aerial protection, uh, and they all pointed fingers at each other, and none could say definitively that they were responsible. On Friday, James Lee Witt Associates issued the final draft of a State Commission report in which it criticizes virtually every aspect of Indian Point's emergency plan. The report concludes that, quote, the current radiological response system, system and capabilities are not adequate to overcome their combined weight and protect the people from an unacceptable dose of radiation in the event of a release from Indian Point, especially if the release is faster or larger than the typical REP exercise scenario. Last month, in an attempt to dismiss Witt's devastating conclusions, FEMA issued its own report, first claiming that Witt has raised nothing new, then, without, then trying without success to rebut Witt's findings. Without ever substantiating its criticism of Witt's arguments, FEMA somehow reaches the conclusion that there is not a single deficiency in Indian Point's emergency plan. Astonishingly, FEMA insists that there is no difference in responding to a radiological release caused by an operational failure and one caused by a terrorist attack. However, Witt has a distinctly different view. He cites as examples terrorists simultaneously targeting roads and bridges to impede evacuation, attacks on responders, and spontaneous and shadow evacuation spurred by public panic. To be clear, the NRC recognizes the possibility of a radiological release with or without terrorism in as little as one to two hours. Yet while FEMA claims it takes fast-breaking scenarios into consideration, it fails to plan or drill for such scenarios. FEMA sidesteps those flaws that Witt identified as particularly serious, the congested road network and population densities around Indian Point, both of which are fixed givens that cannot be altered. FEMA all but ignores emergency scenarios involving a spent fuel pool disaster. FEMA overlooks Witt's contention that a radioactive plume may travel well beyond the 10-mile EPZ. FEMA fails to comprehend the significance of the fact that many first responders, having little faith in the emergency plan, have admitted that, that rather than fulfilling their official duties, they will seek to protect their own families. Probably the most damning statement of all in FEMA's report is the agency's acknowledgement that studies associated with new reg 0654 clearly indicate that for all but a very limited set of conditions, evacuation, even evacuating under a plume, is much more effective than sheltering in place. Clearly, if you can't shelter, if you can't evacuate, you can't protect the people. So what has FEMA's response been to the overwhelming evidence that Indian Point's plan cannot meet our current needs? Finger pointing, bullying, and indecision. When counties declared that they could not, in good conscience, certify the plans were up to date, FEMA wrote a letter to the state instructing them to ignore the counties and certify the plans over county objections. When finally realizing it could not provide reasonable assurance that the plan works, FEMA arbitrarily tacked on a 75-day grace period to the 120 days the state is normally given to comply with certification requirements. We worry that all the buck passing and delays are being used by FEMA to give them time to figure out how to certify a patently unworkable plan. We agree with Mr. Witt that the plan should be improved. Certainly, if you make the improvements that he recommends in his report, that will help to address a minor uh, accident of the plant. But we also agree that the plans cannot be fixed to deal with the post-9-11 world. Chairman Chase, in conclusion, I urge you and the rest of the committee to pay close attention to FEMA and the NRC as this process unfolds. If I may, I would like to make, briefly make several spe specific recommendations to the committee. Regarding emergency planning, instruct FEMA to stop delaying and immediately withdraw its approval of Indian Point's emergency plan in light of overwhelming evidence and unanimous recognition by independent experts, elected officials, and the public that the major deficiencies in the plan cannot be repaired. In case the committee is not aware, and I think that uh, FEMA made reference to it earlier, or the NRC, FEMA has been faced with this issue in the past and acted appropriately. In the aftermath of Hurricane Andrew in 1992, FEMA not only temporarily withdrew its approval of, the Turkey Point's, of Turkey Point's emergency plan, but ordered the Florida nuclear plant to shut down until reasonable assurance could be made that the plan would actually work. Given the terrorist threats and clear deficiencies with Indian Point's emergency plan, the situation in New York is clearly more serious. Uh, Congresswoman Kelly, I would encourage you, uh, recently uh, a, th a theory uh, was proposed uh, in Congresswoman Lowy and uh, Congressman Engels' 
uh, hearing last week, that it might be the case that FEMA uh, and the local counties in reorganizing the emergency plan actually has essentially quarantined Westchester, whereas the evacuation routes used to go north into Putnam and east uh, into Connecticut and so forth, all the routes go south and away from the plant but w are contained within Westchester. Uh, who knows what that means, but it's, an interesting, it's interesting that rather than sending people away to less populated areas, they're actually sending you down towards uh, more populated areas and, in fact, where the winds typically are blowing. Uh, regarding Indian Point security, introduce legislation that would Mr. require Madison. the energy finance Excuse hardening me. of on-site yeah. storage. If you could yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm winding up. I'm sorry. And cast for irradiated spent fuel. Introduce legislation that would require energy finance federalization of military forces at Indian Point and require that the force-on-force -force OSRI test will be conducted at Indian Point, test the actual ability to repel a sophisticated terrorist attack. And finally, recognize that perhaps Indian Point is a unique case and the plant should be shut down. In, the, in 1979, in the wake of Three Mile Island accident, Robert Ryan, NRC, NRC's Director of the Office of State Programs, stated, I think it is insane to have a three-unit reaction on the Hudson River uh, in Westchester your time, County. Your time is up. We're going to okay. have to move on here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, members of the committee. Uh, Mr. Lockbaum.